Hello, my lovelies, and welcome to Where the Road Rises, Law Lessons Legacy, with me, your host, Eileen Curlin Walsh. Of our many aims with this platform, perhaps the most important is to tell our stories, connect and learn and heal and celebrate through our shared heartache and triumph, become better people as we listen to the lessons of the lives of others. And what better time than this warm, festive season and the year's end when we gather with family and friends to reflect on the meaning of our lives, what we have done, what we have failed to do, and what we might do better in the coming years. Our guest today, Cindy Kemp, is the perfect embodiment of our show's mission. Cindy is a seeker and a lifelong learner. She has had decades long focus on social justice and community outreach. She is the host of Your True North podcast, which features interviews with both public and private figures on their internal compass, the principles and values that guide their careers and lives. Cindy will summon the wisdom she has gleaned from her work in state and federal government, the corporate world, teaching, radio, and podcasting to reveal the stories and experiences that have colored and shaped her worldview. Cindy is my dear friend and, full disclosure, my sister-in-law, and I am delighted for you to meet her today. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you, Eileen. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Good, good, good. This is so exciting. Let's set the stage for Cindy by telling us a little about Your True North, the podcast that you have created. What is it about? What's the concept of the show? Yeah, I came up with this idea as I was teaching at St. Xavier University, adjuncting in the evenings there and having guest lecturers come in, and some of them had the most amazing stories to share. At the same time, I was working on the St. Xavier Career Advisory Board, and I discovered that the school was providing wonderful support for students in terms of helping them write resumes and learning how to network and thinking about their career path in graduate school. But I felt that there was one big thing that was never explicitly discussed, at least from my experience, which was their sense of their own guiding principles or internal values and how using those could really help chart their career. Um, I think so often there's this idea that we would ideally follow our bliss or what color is your parachute with career. Yes. And you've heard these, these mm -hmm. things. And I think there are people who find that there is a career out there for them that they're just passionate about. But I think for many other people, it isn't so much the passion that they find in their career as maybe in other areas of life. But nonetheless, it's so important to put ethics and a sense of our own internal values at the center of our career decisions. So the idea for Your True North came out of that desire to help students do that and to harness the, the stories of other people who have really put values at the center of their decision making. Mm, and that is the role then of our beloved storytelling in your podcast. Yes, it is. Um, I've heard, and I'll, I'll give you a, just a, an idea of someone who really influenced me early on. Uh, Father Michael Flager was at St. Xavier doing a lecture. And before that, he spoke with a group of students about his own sort of career path, how he became an activist priest, uh, a, a white man living in a largely African-American neighborhood. And a student said, well, tell us a little bit more about how you really became this, this person that you are. And he said, well, there were two things that happened to me early in life. He said, one, I went to a Native American reservation in high school and I saw how they lived. And he said, that really affected me. The second thing, I rode my bike down to Marquette Park when Martin Luther King was marching there. Mm. And I watched my parents' friends throw stones at Dr. Mm. King. He said, that's what made me who I am. And I felt like those stories are so powerful. And it isn't enough just to have someone share it with a small group of students. It, it really should be shared more broadly. And I think the power of podcasting and media to make stories available to anyone who wants to listen, especially on demand. Podcasts are really amazing because we can just listen when it's convenient for us. Um, and St. Xavier has a radio station. So I started with the idea of a small radio show that would be interview-based and then broadened it to a podcast. 
Beautiful. And we really have a lovely receptive audience now for podcasting and for that warm voice rather than detached professionalism of many years ago. So it truly is a wonderful environment for storytelling and particularly the kind of stories that you are telling with your guests, Cindy. Tell us a few of your more memorable guests and why. Yeah. Well, um, there's a physician who lives here in the Chicago area, originally from Pakistan, Dr. Samina Katak, and she did one of my early interviews. She comes from a very influential family in Pakistan. Her great uncle, Ghaffar Khan, was called the Frontier Gandhi, and he worked closely with Mohandas Gandhi, um, Ghaffar Khan working up in the northwest um, part of, oh, at that time, India. But both he and Gandhi working to free uh, the, Brit the Indian uh, country and people from British rule mm -hmm. and using nonviolent civil resistance as a method. So Samina grew up with this family tradition and her father, who was a teenager at that time, spent time in jail. Mm -hmm. um, and so they came and, and talked about those experiences. Samina also works as a psychiatrist within the Cook County Health System and she serves people who often have um, deep sort of health issues, who need someone to listen and to help them um, gain healing in their lives. So she has some really powerful stories. I also interviewed a professor at St. Xavier, and his interview to me was so memorable. We, we actually completed an interview, and when the camera, when, or when the recording equipment was turned off, he said, you know, there was so much more I could have said. And I said, well, let's do it again. So a couple weeks later, we recorded a second interview, and that time, he had had more time to think, and he started his interview by saying, you know, I grew up wealthy and white, and it's given me so much privilege in the world that I've come to recognize. But as a young person, I didn't realize how those, those factors of my life gave me so many advantages. And then he went on to describe how his parents, by virtue of having money and resources, could make sure he went to the best schools, could have the best name brand clothing, could provide not only um, tuition for college, but help buying a, a home for him to live in mm -hmm. when he went to graduate school. He said these are incredible advantages, and he said so many people in life don't have them. And he said perhaps even more powerful is the fact that so many people don't recognize those things. So he said his own um, life journey allowed him to really reflect and see how many advantages he had had. But I think for so many people, those are things that go uns unsaid. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have just loved doing interviews, as I know you do too, because you learn so much about people and sometimes can help them uncover some of the most important aspects of what their, their life journey has been. Absolutely, and we, we learn so much every time we speak to someone yeah. we become deeper they give um, and 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 we learn and yes. it's it's a beautiful beautiful process yes. Cindy you have a master's in divinity from Harvard University and you teach world religion to college students do you focus particularly on religious beliefs in your true north well in your true north I think what I'm trying to help um, I'm, my, my target audience is especially younger people, and I think I'm trying to help them see that having a strong sense of values is really important as they make decisions about life and about career. The guests often do base at least a part of their values and their religious beliefs or their upbringing, but not everyone. There are people who've come on and said, you know, I really wasn't raised religiously, or I was, but it isn't that meaningful to me as an adult, but I still have a strong sense of my values. And that's an interesting conversation because sometimes I think people who live in a very religious sort of world think that the only way to have a strong sense of values is through a religious identity. And I, I don't think uh -huh. that that is true. I think there are people who ground their sense of their principles or their ethics and other things. Um, I think our schools give children an enormous um, sort of sense of what is important when we, our, our children in schools learn that um, being kind, being mm. grateful, listening, having critical thinking skills, these are all also values that mm -hmm. are communicated. So I think for some people it does come from a religious background or a spiritual background and for others, no. But again, I think almost anyone, if they think about it, can really identify some beliefs that they really hold at the center of who they are. Mm -hmm. And ideally use those to chart chart their career and their life. And I'm sure there are times, Cindy, that people don't even realize what their values are. 
they're living by them, but to articulate them is very, very life-affirming for them also. So you probably help people uncover values and at least articulate them that they may not have done so before. Yeah, I think for me, I and I'm now thinking about an interview I did with a, a man who lives here in Chicago, um, wasn't raised here, and as a young man, so he grew up in the 50s and was in the 1960s realizing he would be drafted to go to Vietnam. And he came from a background that really emphasized peacemaking, and he knew that that was not something he was willing to do, was to go serve in the military. Uh, so he thought about it already as a high school student, and then he decided that he would not only not be drafted, he would not do community service work either, which was typically the option that was offered. So he served 18 months in federal prison and mm. was sentenced at 18 years old, which I find just remarkable that he had such a strong sense of, you know, not wanting to be a part of war making. And when I asked him in the interview how he came to that decision to not do community service, which I think most people would feel would be the alternative, he said he still felt that it gave too much of a rubber stamp to the United States war in Vietnam and he was unwilling to do that. For him it felt um, more authentic to go to prison. And ironically in prison he learned so much about the, the lives of other people. He again mm -hmm. had grown up with access to education, with a fairly mm -hmm. solid middle class upbringing. But in prison, he realized that so many of the people there were minorities. They were people who came from lower classes, who didn't have good schools, who didn't have solid sort of um, families that could really guide them. So he said it was an enormous learning experience as well that impacted his whole life. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another person who at first served as a, he came in as a guest lecturer for my students. But I thought this story is much too powerful to not record it in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I know we talk about great books, these enduring traditions of literature, but I think some of these stories are just great stories that also deserve to be recorded and hung on to and really shared, especially again targeting younger people, but mm -hmm. I think for anyone who's interested in storytelling, mm -hmm. um, for many of us, we I think we just love to listen to someone tell a story about their life. Especially the unsung heroes, yes. right? Yes. Cindy, what about your own spiritual belief? Has it been shaped by speaking with guests about theirs? Do you believe we all have a higher purpose? Well, I don't know if I would call it a higher purpose. I think for me, the word meaning, I think almost any human being wants to find some kind of meaning in their life. And I think that that would be, I, I hesitate to say shared by all people, but shared by many people. Um, I was raised with a very strong religious background, and I think it serves me well in some respects, but I also think that it is sometimes limiting, especially when you're raised with a, a sort of religious idea that one tradition is more right than the others. And so I've had to really examine that for myself, and I think my study of world religions, my experiences traveling and, and working in many different places has broadened my worldview so much, and it's given me a lot more room to accept the fact that there are other religious traditions that have validity, equal validity in my mind. And I also find very interesting the path of those who don't identify with religion, who would say, you know, I guess I have a sense of ethics and a sense of meaning that comes from other places. Um, I, I'll tell you a little story about my own teaching experience. So I think sometimes people will sort of laugh when they understand that I teach classes about religion because I think the fact is many young people today would be somewhat skeptical about the claims of religion. And I, I really respect that. Um, I teach a class about nonviolence, and that came out of my experiences studying religious traditions like Buddhism and Hinduism as well as Christianity and seeing that peacemaking is an important common theme and the use of nonviolence in the modern world. Mm -hmm. People like Gandhi and Martin Luther King who really changed the laws, changed history by using nonviolent civil resistance but grounded what they did, at least for those men, and I think of Thich Nhat Hanh and Dorothy Day, people who really grounded their action in their religious conviction. And so I put together a class that I felt really spoke to not only, I guess, a sense of how religion can be used as a tool for peacemaking, um, but also I think drawing in people that almost anyone can respect for their stand in the world and asking students to consider that they that these people really took seriously the role of religion in their lives. Again, that's not to say that everyone must find a place for religion, um, but it, it allowed me to create a very different kind of religious studies course that I've taught quite a few times 
and, and certainly probably more timely now than ever with the use of civil resistance around the world to change so many things about our, our politics and our social policy. So um, yeah, that was a great challenge and I, I feel like you know it was fun to, to think about how religion could be uh, contemporary and really speak to people, even those who don't necessarily have a lot of interest in it. Yes, enduring. Cindy, you referred to your travel and your career path has been an unusual one. You've traveled all over the world in government service, working for the federal government, you've worked for state government. You've traveled all over the U.S. in your corporate world and positions, and you've taught as an adjunct professor, and you now freelance in radio and podcasting. So what advice would you give to our younger viewers on making and choosing a career path? Yeah, that's a big question, and there's so many dimensions to it. I think on the one hand, there are these really big things that sit right at the middle, which again, thinking for a young person about what it is that they really care about, whether they frame it as what are my values, what are guiding principles that I would, would hope to, to really use to chart some kind of a, a career and life path. Um, but I think also then there's all the smaller dimensions, the things that are also important, like how much stress can I handle and how much would I enjoy? I often tell my students, if when a big project is due in the morning and you're a little behind, do you rise to that? Does the adrenaline flow and it helps you get it done? Or do you unravel? Because that'll be a, a, a sort of secret kind of for you to know, mm -hmm. are you going to do well in a career with a lot of stress or is it not going to be a good thing for you? Um, I think the amount of hours that a person has to give to their job, easier if someone finds a job they're truly passionate about, then I think it's easier to give lots of overtime to work. But I think for some people, passion is outside of their job, and that is fine too. We all need to keep our bills paid, so work mm -hmm. is an important feature of life. Um, but I think for some people, it might be that finding a job that suits their lifestyle and then having passions that are there kind of part-time things or after-hours activities is also fine. Um, I would just say too, I think careers that allow a person to grow within them are also wonderful. Um, I've worked in healthcare for a number of years and I think so often I see physicians and nurses who have many opportunities to do a variety of things. So not only doing clinical care with patients, but also teaching and doing research. I think those are wonderful careers that lend themselves to kind of stretching and growing within the career. Now that said, as you know, so many people change careers in the course of their lifetime, many people a couple of times, and that's okay too. I think if, if an education allows us to learn how to learn and how to retool and adapt, that's also a really important component. So whether in high school and college, that students sort of remember there's what you learn that's very specific and, and applicable to a career, but it's also that ability to, to keep learning. And as you mentioned, being a lifelong learner is, I think, an important asset. So those are a few thoughts that I have, but it's such a big topic. Hard to do it justice. Yes, and Sandy, how would you extend out that wonderful advice for our mature viewers? Many of our viewers are seniors and they're caregivers who have sort of put their own dreams and goals on hold as they support and care for others. How do they cultivate their own garden, find their passion? Would you have any advice for them? Is there an age limit on this lifelong learning? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't think there's any age limit. Um, I know as I'm getting a little bit closer to my own retirement, I'm starting to think about things that I'd love to be able to do when I have more time. Um, I certainly think that, you know, again, learning and, um, and doing things. I think our local libraries offer so many wonderful programs. So yes. whether it's book clubs or it's um, volunteering and working with organizations to teach literacy to, um, you mentioned gardening, I love to garden. So um, volunteering at places that need help, um, people working in the dirt, and, and civic engagement would be another really important aspect of I think what, you know, what other people can do, especially as they become older, and modeling that, taking a young person along. If you go to an event, to a lecture, to a, a rally, to volunteer somewhere, trying to bring a, a, a young friend, bringing a grandchild along. Um, I know, of course, there are people who still have severe limits on time, and as you're mentioning, mentioning caregivers are, are so often really stretched and asked to as to you know, do so much and have so little time left for themselves. But as I've heard you say, when you talk about you know, the opportunity to really, um, I think, grow and still do things outside of our nine to five, 
even a half an hour a day, you know, deciding that you're going to read books that you care about and putting a half an hour a day in for five days a week. At the end of a year, you can have read a lot of books or an hour or two a week of volunteering or doing research. I think there are so many opportunities, even when time is limited and um, we're in our later years. So oh, I certainly so hope for myself that I'll have time to do some new things as I get into my, my retirement. I love a Sunday, an hour, half an hour a day. And, and if it's too hard on your own, join a group, yeah. a group of like-minded uh, people is a great right. way to advance those goals right. and, and get yourself just out of your yeah. world and, and thinking and feeling yeah. a little bit different. I could mention something specific when you're talking about, you know, starting a group, joining a group. Um, I was in a bookstore uh, about a year and a half ago and saw that they offered an ethics book club. Now, I've been in lots of book clubs over the years, but I'd never been in an ethics book club. And I thought, well, that sounds like a great, a great activity. So I approached a local library and said, would you be willing to start something like this? And they said, well, we would, but we'd like someone to lead it, guide it. And so I did volunteer to do that. But it's been a great activity. Um, I've met a lot of new people starting a new book club and doing it through the library gave me a certain amount of support and um, and reading books that you know I think are really important and, and sharing books. You know I think mm -hmm. any of us who are readers when you share books with other people it builds beautiful connections. Yes. There's also the great books book clubs and I know there's some of those here and there's a whole program at the University of Chicago which Again, if I have time in my retirement, I'd love to be doing that because reading the classics, not only the Western classics, but they have an Eastern classics program now too, and they're both four-year certificate programs. So again, I think those would be wonderful things to get to do in retirement. And viewers, books are a very special connection for Cindy and I because that's how we met. Yes. And the Oak Lawn Great Books Club 20 years ago. And she went on to marry my brother. Yes. So very special <laughs> yes. connection yeah. indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cindy, view, uh, viewers, we have discussed many times that uh, we advocate writing our stories, telling our stories, our values and our beliefs, and getting them all into an ethical will. Cindy attended one of my workshops in 2010 and she wrote her own ethical will. So maybe tell the viewers a little bit about that experience and how it was for you and, and what emerged throughout the weekend. Yeah, it was a wonderful opportunity and I had never heard of an ethical will until then and I was so intrigued when you talked about this. And I think having at that time really young children, it occurred to me that I would like to put something down for them. Um, that they could, you know, none of us knows how long we live, how, you know, we, we, we might mm -hmm. die, and if, especially it's sudden, mm -hmm. I really wanted to capture some of the things that I, uh, values that I have, experiences, um, things that I wanted to share with them, but not only with them, I think the activity of writing something kind of sometimes helps you discover things that you're only partially aware of yourself. And so doing that and, and putting those things down on paper, I think there were things my boys would never have known about me. Um, things that for me were real revelations as well. I reflected a lot on my childhood and how I had been raised with this very, what I would think of as a fairly rigid religious childhood. And, my, and, and just as an example, so going to a religious school, um, I was raised going to church twice every Sunday and also going to Sunday school afterwards, spending hours a day on a Sunday at church. Um, I, it, I've raised my children differently. Um, John and I have decided to have a different approach with our own children. We've exposed them to religion, but not in that same sort of way. And I think for my children, it would be shocking to realize how religious my own childhood was. So it was really wonderful to be able to capture some of those stories, experiences. And I have reread my ethical will in the years since then, so that's eight years ago. Um, even in those eight years, the changes that have happened within me, um, the shift in my own thinking. So I'll look forward to the opportunity to write another ethical will in the future yes. and hang on to the first one because of course we change as, as our lives you know, progress. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was a great experience and something I'd encourage anybody to do because again, yes. we don't know. And I'll just share this with you too. I lost a dear friend recently, very suddenly. And I've been participating in a group that's been reading a book called The Five Invitations, which is a book about death and how to enrich our sense of life by living with death on our shoulder, knowing that we all do die. The first lesson in the book is don't wait. Don't wait because you don't know how long you have. And so this dear friend of mine who had died so suddenly in her 50s, um, 
yeah, I, I know she didn't wait. She lived a really rich, full life. But I think for any of us as well, if there's things you care about, it's so important just to get going and to do it. So I'm very glad mm. that I have an ethical will that I've written, but I'll look forward to doing another one in the future. Yes, and yeah. while it's wonderful to rewrite them, often just that one document is all our, uh, our viewers leave. So do consider writing your ethical will, and there's lots of information on how to do so if you just visit curlamoshla. Dot com. So what are the values or even one value that you live your life by now, Cindy? Yeah, and I think this has been very much influenced by my conversations with people on your true north. Um, I think empathy for me is perhaps right now the, the value that I would think of as so central to my life. Um, I think that it's so important to try to, as we all talk about this sort of, you know, walking in someone else's shoes to the extent that we can to reserve judgment, to listen liberally, to mm -hmm. judge leanly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, a, a little story that I could share with you. And before I share the story, let me just say about empathy, I think it's also important, even if we have the, the sort of same experience as another person, we lose someone, we, we go through illness, it's not the identical experience that that other person has. So while we we hope to be able to share what they are going through and to let them know that we really care, we don't know exactly what they're experiencing. So I think it's important to remember that. At the same time, the fact that I've experienced pain and someone else is in pain gives me a real window into what that experience is for them. Mm -hmm. So um, I think empathy, it, it's a little bit nuanced. But an example, I know uh, currently in our country there's a lot of anti-immigrant feeling, which I, I so um, just see as a terrible thing because I think all of us here are immigrants. Unless we're Native American and our families go back many, many generations. So many of us, our families have arrived here within the last 50 or 100 years. And even for families that go back several hundred years, we're still relative newcomers in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. So I think we all have to remember that. A story from my own life, when my grandfather was in his late 80s, early 90s, he admitted to me one day, now he had his family had come here from Holland, but he said he had gone to kindergarten speaking no English. And I said, but you were born here. And he said, yeah. And I said, your mother was born here. And he said, yeah. But he said, my father was an immigrant from Holland and he wanted to speak Dutch in our home. So we spoke Dutch. He said, I went to school speaking no English as a second generation American born citizen. And I found that fascinating because mm -hmm. I think so often our perception of newer immigrants in our country is that, oh, they're hanging on too much to their own culture or their own language. I think that's a very normal response to being uprooted and, and even when you want to go to a new place, never mind people who come as refugees. So just that bit of humility and that reminder to, to be hospitable to people, to try to have empathy, to try to understand this is so hard to come to another part of the world. You've, you've done it yourself. I think it's a little bit easier when you come from a place that is English speaking. Nevertheless, you know, you transplant yourself, your life. It's hard to adjust to a new place. And so I think the anti-immigrant sentiments that we're seeing in our country are so regrettable. And I think if we all stop and think a little bit and reflect on our own family's experience, we realize that Yes, we, you know, we all struggle, I think, to transplant ourselves to a new place, mm -hmm. and it's hard for everyone. Yes, Cindy, have you now found your true north? Well, I think it's always a work in progress. Um, I, you know, one of the lessons from this group that I've been participating in, the five invitations, and the idea of don't wait. Um, I think there's a lot of things I'm still waiting to do, and yet ultimately I think it'd be great to get to a place where I'm not waiting anymore, that I feel like I'm trying to, to really live everything that I, I hope to do and be. Um, my project with this podcast is something that's still newer. Now I've been working on it for five years, but because I have a day job and children, it's still a very piecemeal sort of step-by-step -step thing. Um, I'm hoping that in the coming year I get a little bit more momentum with it. But um, yeah, I think you know my own true north is certainly a combination of trying to live my own values as fully as possible, um, living a life that's rich with friends and family, um, continuing to be that lifelong learner. So uh, yeah, I, I hope that I'm getting a little closer all the time, but work in progress, Eileen, oh, definitely. Yeah. That's beautiful, Sunday. And how would you want to be remembered? What is your footprint gonna be in the world? 
You know, that's a it's a pretty big question. It is. Um, I think again that idea of being someone who's always curious, who's open to life and to experience. That to me would be very important. I think also the last few years, I've really tried to live with this idea that just say yes, just say yes, and it. It sometimes gets you in a little bit of trouble when people ask you if you'll do something, if you'll share something, but I think it's easy to be somebody who hesitates and who kind of waits a little bit too long and the opportunity passes. And I think, and your own influence on me has been wonderful because I've seen you say yes to so many things. And I think that that for me has been a great guide. And occasionally I have to kind of remind myself that I, I might get overcommitted when I'm always saying yes. But I think it opens me to so many new experiences in life. And so that for me has been a great, at least at this stage in my life, just throwing myself open to new possibilities and new avenues and, and saying yes. I love it. You will also be remembered as a wonderful mother, a great thinker, and a dear friend. Well, thank you. Let's end with your favorite poem or book or quote or inspirational passage. Yeah, well, I, you know, there would be many. Ever since high school, certainly college, I've kept a book of quotes. And so I'm always like copying things, handwriting, you know, writing myself and putting this in. And it's quite a large book. There's so many quotes that I find to be inspiring or enlightening. Uh, but I heard someone recently quote a little Buddhist saying that I found really, for me, very profound. I think because it it also sort of is the, the counter side to all of the, the efforts to find meaning in life and the importance and beauty of life. This little quote is, all roads lead nowhere, choose one with heart. And I think that as much as, yes, life is full of meaning and richness, we do all die one day and none of us really knows what lies on the other side. And many of the things that we pursue, I think, don't necessarily lead to great, um, great accomplishment and it's that sort of humility to remember that life is is just a it's a short thing there's a proverb about life being a dance across gravestones and we're, we're here and we should make the most of it while we are but it it also is a very finite experience and I think we have to kind of remember that too the part about choosing one with heart choosing a path with heart yes at least you know always lead with your heart and look for opportunities and experiences that enrich others so that would and be. don't wait and say yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. How can our viewers find your True North? Yeah, well, I, um, I'm glad you, you asked about that. So uh, we have podcasts up on our website, which is yourtruenorthpodcast.com. Um, they have been broadcast from time to time on WXAV here in Chicago. That's St. Xavier's radio station. It's a very small bandwidth. Um, but yes, the, the best way is just to go to yourtruenorthpodcast.com and you can listen to podcasts right there. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sunday, for your wisdom and your insight. Thank you, viewers, for watching. One final reminder of Katie's gift. If you would like to bring a gift to my office at 113th in Harlem, between now and the 20th, there is still time for you to get your free power of attorney for finance, power of attorney for healthcare, and living well. As you know, Katie was a little girl for brain surgery in the hospital, and the girl in the hospital room with her had no toys, no gifts. She shared hers, and now at 15 years of age, she still is collecting toys every Christmas for children in hospital. So in the spirit of giving, we will give you your powers of attorney. Just bring a gift to our office. Our greatest need this year is gifts for babies and gift cards for teenagers. So have a lovely, warm Christmas holiday season, and I will see you in the new year. Thank you.